understand that the majority of you guys want to start your own company or start your own business in some fashion or some way. I'm going to pull up some notes here, but basically I want to tell you about my journey and what I did along the way and why I chose what I did. Um, but I thought it would be really entertaining and fun to think about my experience with Cirque du Soleil and some of the takeaways that I gained through that experience and how I believe that that's actually applicable to starting your own company. So let me pull up these notes while I catch my breath, because I do have sports-induced asthma, unfortunately, but it's all good. All right, so the first, I have five takeaways that um, I think are helpful. I'm going to just kind of rattle them off. Um, I understand you guys have to do some homework assignments here, but um, timing is everything. So set up safeguards when you take risks. So timing is everything, all right? So whatever risks you have to take, you want to figure out how to mitigate those risks. Number two, manners matter. So in other words, practice respect and empathy. A lot of that's straightforward, but you wouldn't believe how often you forget that because you're in your own world and you kind of forget what others are experiencing. So as much as you can, you want to practice respect and empathy and think what are they experiencing, what are they going through in their own shoes today, right now, at this moment. Number two, misery loves company. In other words, nobody likes to feel alone, and whatever we can do to let people know they are not alone is the most powerful way to engage users. <coughs> number three, or I'm sorry, that was three. Number four, and feel free to um, ask if I'm going too fast here, but number four, of course, don't forget to laugh. Um, laughter is the best remedy for anything, and being able to keep perspective while you're going through hardships is a really powerful, powerful tool. Number five, I like to think about this a lot, especially since that baby I just had seven months ago was baby number four. Um, what doesn't kill us makes us stronger, and if we can, gather our strength and perspective through life experiences. So that's what I'm going to talk about tonight are the life experiences. And I thought one of the key stories that came to mind um, was my experience about ten years ago. I was performing for Cirque du Soleil, and I think you guys got to see the video of um, Ka, is that correct? Yeah. Okay, the first one, just understanding um, what it's like to create a show, and did you hear how our mom said, how do you eat an elephant one, one bite at a time, right? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you for watching that video. So this is about timing. Here we are 10 years ago, and I'm getting ready to get married. And I actually got engaged right before I joined Cirque du Soleil. We had, um, we had had this very long engagement. We were trying to find a time to get married when there were, the show was dark. And that means lights don't go on, the show's not in production. But it was a moving target because our show was actually delayed five months because the wow factor in our show. Actually, let me ask has anybody seen Ka? Anybody know? Okay. Okay, great. And that's at MGM Grand. It's this revolving, um, revolving stage. And that's basically the wow factor. And that actually was broken. So it was delayed five months. Um, and so I'm trying to figure out, when am I going to get married? How do we set a date? How do we figure all that out? It was very stressful at the time. And I was honestly quite distracted that week because I was leaving for Hawaii. I don't know if you know that I went to the same school as Mackenzie. And so, oh, yeah, I didn't mention yeah, that. Part. So yeah, so I went to Punahou Ho as well. And um, we were having a destination wedding there, so to speak, because now um, I was living in Las Vegas at the time. Anyway, we were on the boat. I don't know if you guys saw that, that, yeah, that revolving apparatus. Well, we got to create, we were part of the creation, I was an original cast member, we got to create how to move on that boat and how to move consistent, consistently, because there are a lot of variables there. And I would hang, and I'll go ahead and demonstrate this, assuming this isn't going to fall, might, but we'll see. Anyway, I would hang on the boat, hook my feet, and rock back like this. And literally, you're in the front row, and I'm rocking back, and it was hanging literally over where if you reached up, you could touch me, I could touch you. And it was very much like an amusement ride. Very, very exciting. That was one of my favorite things to do, and I helped design that. And meanwhile, the boat is rotating. We're going like this. And I end up rocking back. And it's literally the night before I'm departing for my wedding, and I'll be gone for a week. And we ended up having, by the way, to take a whole week off from, from Cirque, uh, because the show ended up not being down when we thought it was. Thankfully, county manager let me get married anyway. But that night, I fell out of the boat. And I didn't only just fall off the boat on the stage. I fell onto the audience. It was one of the most embarrassing, most frightening, and most eye-opening experiences I've ever experienced, where I decided to take a risk, and I didn't set up a safeguard. 
what used to be implemented was another castmate would reach over my leg and lock me in with his body and reach over like this, because we're all supposed to be caught in this horrendous storm. And so it's supposed to be organized chaos, right? Well, that night it was not organized and it was pure chaos, because the guy that's supposed to do this actually got out with a thumb injury the week before, and I was supposed to train the other castmate to do that, but I'm like, I don't need to do that. I'm not going to fall. Like, <laughs> what are the chances of that happening? You know, and I didn't want to set up that safety because I didn't think I needed it. And that's exactly what a safety is. You want to mitigate the risks because you don't think you need them. So you set up that safety and you get ready to figure out, well, what could possibly happen? Even it's so unlikely. But there I was. My foot came unhooked. There was no person hooking me in. I end up flipping over, literally hanging onto the boat with one hand. This boat weighs two tons. There's no way I'm going to stay on that boat with one hand. My grip peels off. I do this rotation. My legs are flying in the air. Now, thankfully, they did actually train us on stunt falls, and so I did know how to land an airbag, but that didn't really serve me as well landing on people. So I end up literally falling flat, thankfully, fairly, fairly, you know, um, straight forward on this side, basically landing like this. My left heel ends up hitting an audience member on the head. It was a pretty, pretty uh, forceful impact. Now, thankfully, I didn't get hurt, and I really think it was because the audience's laps, like, cushioned my landing. And I land on their laps, crumple to the floor, and it was just the most surreal experience I've had. I thought, oh my gosh, this could not have happened. It was slow motion as I'm doing this thing. No way, no way. And all I could think was, you know, newspaper flashes and, you know, all over the media, Cirque du Soleil, you know, um, Acrobat falls in the audience, fired, and whatever else happens, I don't know. But I was so worried, and what ended up happening was I, told, I was told by company management, you know what, you're not the first person to fall in the audience, and sadly you won't be the last. But we're actually glad it happened tonight, and we're glad it's you. Now, the, the way and the reason they were glad it happened tonight was because they had set up a safe bar. They had actually told the front row, they had said, sort of like sitting in an exit aisle of an airplane, they said, we want to let you know that you guys are in a very active part of the show. There's going to be a lot of excitement over you, around you, next to you. And literally, like audience, not audience, but uh, acrobats are crawling along the stage and just in your face in that way. And so it's very engaging. But of course, they didn't warn them. And an acrobat would be falling on you tonight. But they gave enough of a warning and enough of setting the stage for expectations that, you know, if you would like to move, you may. And so they gave the option to those um, audience members. And that was, I think, just so important and uh, really telling about how Cirque du Soleil has to always mitigate risks and think about what are they taking on, what sort of liability are they taking on. Now, the other reason they thought it, it was good that it was me, if it's good at all that it happens, is they said, you know, Sarah, you are probably one of the most polite people we've ever met, and we're sure that you treated that audience member really nicely. And I thought of it, I said, gosh, yeah, I didn't even, I didn't even know what I said, but I thought more, and I said, yeah, actually, actually I did. I started apologizing profusely, and <laughs> I fell down, and I'm like, are you okay? And the, her date was like clutching her and consoling her. And he looks at me now on the ground and he puts out his arm and says, are you okay? And I thought about it. I'm like, yeah, I, I guess I am. So I got back up and I looked at the boat and realized I needed to get back up on the boat and finish the act. Because I, I was okay. I didn't have any broken bones that I knew of, no serious pain. So I got back up and finished the act. Um, very eye-opening experience, very scary, very jittery, you know, inducing, um, and realized that timing is everything. And the more we can create safeguards to mitigate risks and minimize, you know, any potential falls, obviously, the better. But it's hard to anticipate what those falls are. And if any safeguards or safeties are implemented, keep them in place. Now, the idea that manners matter is really important, right? Because we want to emphasize that respect and empathy are huge. I don't know if you guys know, but there's really a push these days to teach empathy. How do we engage our children as they're learning? How do we teach them what empathy is? And as mentioned, I'm the mother of four. So I have four kids. I have three girls and a boy. And I have a set of identical twins. So ages are seven, four and a half, and now seven months. And it's so important to think about what it is that we're role modeling and what are we teaching to our children. 
Now, the relationships, I think that's a fairly obvious one, but just keep in mind that it comes back over and over, and the more you can pay your respects, but also express your gratitude, the better. So when I gave birth to my first daughter, I was still employed by Cirque du Soleil, and I decided actually not to go back to full-time work, um, so I never uh, returned after maternity leave. And part of the reason why was because I had experienced a miscarriage before I had Emma. My husband traveled 60% of the time. He actually, he and I met um, as undergraduates at Stanford, and he was working as an engineer here in the Bay Area, and I was hopping all over the place. Anyway, once we had Emma, I decided, you know what, I've gone through what I have. I want to hang in there, and I'm not quite ready to go back to work. So it's an interesting perspective um, to think about what parents endure. And I don't know if any of you have children yourself and what you go through, but it is hard. It's really hard to figure out how to manage work and your lifestyle and what are your dreams, and how do you maintain a sense of identity for yourself. Okay, so what I did once I had Emma was I was given a baby wrap, and I don't know if you guys have seen this, maybe you've seen Ergo's or Moby wraps or some sort of woven wraps, but basically babies are tied onto the chest or the back of a parent or of a caregiver. And that was really life-changing for me. But once I became a mom, I felt very, very isolated because I chose not to continue with surf, and I chose to figure out, you know, I, I had become a certified Pilates instructor, but I want to figure out how could I do both? How could I be a mom, be that person I wanted to be as a mother, but also fulfill the role as um, a Pilates instructor, especially coming from a very physical background. So I reached out to Moby Rap and I said, hey, I'm thinking about making this fitness DVD, or at least empowering other moms to know that you can do this too. So it was very much a point in my life where I was transitioning and trying to figure out, well, what relationships do I want to build? So I reached out to Moby myself, and it was thanks to them just happening to be at a moment where they were looking for people because they were creating their own uh, instructional video. And they said, hey, how would you like to be our model for an instructional video? And at the time, my oldest actually at that point was 15 months old, and I literally lived in the movie wrap. I just wore it as a shawl, and I slid Emma in and out. I figured out how to breastfeed in it. She could sleep in it. It was just so comforting for both of us. And I figured out, because there was a studio that let me teach Pilates with my baby strapped onto me, I figured out that I could get on the equipment and actually demonstrate the exercises. And what was so interesting was it made my back feel better. Isn't that crazy? You think you don't, you know, you don't anticipate that having, you know, a, a 15 to 20 pound child on you is going to help your body, but it helped me open up my chest and think about postural awareness. Has anybody here taken Pilates before? Okay, have you guys been on the Pilates equipment? Do you know what a reformer is? You have. You guys know what reformers are. So it's all spring resistance. For those of you who don't know, basically Pilates is designed, it's spring resistance designed to improve your postural awareness, to think about what happens between your ribs and your hips. And if we can sit up a little bit taller, open up the chest, breathe, and think about what's happening in our core, we can actually support the pelvis, support the spine, and improve the mobility of our joints and stability of our trunk. So overall, the idea is it reduces pain, helps us feel better, and age at a graceful level. Well, when I joined CERC, I was very much a liability. And the reason why was because I had a stress fracture in my freshman year at Stanford and I was on a gymnastic scholarship. I almost registered my freshman year because of that injury. But that pain actually helped define, I think, the route and the choice I made in how I structured my business. Because of that pain, I was actually told by CERC, you have to take Pilates. You, you, we have to make sure that that back injury does not come back to haunt us. Because we're investing in you, you better invest in your health. So then, because I had developed more and more awareness of my body, and they decided to invest in me, I went ahead and, of course, had to train Pilates. And, and actually was introduced to Pilates at Stanford as um, an undergraduate. But the point is that now CERT was saying, you have to learn how to use the equipment. You have to take care of yourself. So they are investing in me. And there's a relationship right there with their employees to make sure, hey, we want to set you up for success. How do we make sure if you are a liability in any way, how do we take good care of you? So that helped transition. Now, this brings me to the third point about misery loves company. Nobody likes to be feeling alone. And there's something truly comforting to find out and to hear those words, me too. If anybody ever feels upset or scared or anxious and somebody wraps their arms around them and says, don't worry, I feel the same way, me too. That idea that we are not alone, that is powerful. So when you pick 
a problem that you want to solve with your business, you want to find something that is obviously identifiable, but truly relatable. So something that encourages people to tie into a feeling, a sensation, and the more physical it is, even better. Um, so in my case, I really think that pain that I felt freshman year helped direct me because I got over that back injury at Stanford, partly because of Pilates and retraining my core, also thanks to some cortisone shots that helped me relieve the inflammation. Got back into shape, became an All-American, went on to win some fitness contests, and then joined Cirque du Soleil, was told I had to do Pilates, was thrilled to actually learn how to use the equipment, take good care. And that was tremendous, because now what I do, the majority of my business, yes, part of it works with moms, and yes, that was very applicable at my time in my life when I decided to start a Sobe Sport Family Fitness. But the overarching part of my business, which is Sarah Harding Fitness, Inc., actually is private Pilates consultation. And yes, yeah, some of my clients are mothers or parents, but the majority of my clients are actually just like you and me who are trying to run a business. The majority of my clients want in-home training where I design their Pilates equipment, home studio. I help them learn which equipment I think is applicable to their particular lifestyle. And I help them get on the equipment. And I basically provide longevity, longevity in their very stressful lives to reduce the stress, to bring down the anxiety, the anxiousness, or, or that sensation of, OK, I've got to go every single second counts. How do I go faster? How do I go faster? But bringing the energy down. And part of what we do is we do breathing. Now, I would say I'm in the business of pain. I'm in the business of learning how to calm that pain, how to rehabilitate from pain, and how to prevent pain altogether. And a lot of that is purely stress management. Super interesting. So, what I would like to do is bring you through a quick exercise of actually breathing. So if you choose, it's your choice, but if you choose, you put your hands on your tummy, and it's pretty low across your hips here. Sit up as tall as you can. Feel the weight on the front of your sits bones, so the base of your pelvis. Open up your chest. Feel your shoulders press down. Close your eyes if you choose. You're going to inhale through your nose. You're going to exhale through your mouth. And exhale through your mouth. Now, as you do this, as you blow, I want you to think you're feeling a zippering up feeling, almost like you're zippering a pair of pants. It really starts in your deep pelvic floor, zippers up through your transverse abdominis to your belly button. And what you're doing is you're engaging your core <coughs> muscles, which is helping support your spine. So go ahead and take three more deep breaths in through your nose, out through your mouth. Now, as this energy goes zippering up from the base of your pelvis up, I want you to feel your shoulders press down and back. So you're gently going to retract your scaps, and you're going to open up your chest, and you're going to feel this length between your ears and your shoulders. So it's opposing energy there. And really what you're doing is lengthening the spine. So two more deep breaths in through your nose and out through your mouth. And as you blow, sit up even taller in through your nose and out through your mouth. Your eyes and just have the sensation of the breathing itself helps ground us, helps us bring that energy down. So breathing is actually an excellent tool for calming, um, calming any anxiety. So that is something that I do, which seems so basic. But a lot of times we forget how to breathe. And if you're an athlete, you can really appreciate when we get nervous and anxious and the butterflies start coming up here, if we can get more centered and grounded and have those butterflies fly in formation we can use that adrenaline. That adrenaline's good stuff. That's exactly what helps us get through those really challenging times. We just need to ground ourselves and focus. We need to be calm and focused. And I always have to laugh because whenever I'm trying to pile all the kids in the car and sometimes I feel like I'm hurting cats, like, come on, no, no, put on that shoe, let's go, buckle up, buckle up. I'm trying to get them to school before I rush off, <coughs> then come to a very calm place to talk to my clients in their homes. I always tell my kids, calm and focused because there's no time to make mistakes. There's no time to get so anxious and worked up that we lose sight of what we're doing. And that's when the mistakes happen. And that's actually why I think I fell out of the boat too, was because I was so wrapped up in my focus elsewhere as opposed to being right here in present. Okay? So that's the third idea that misery loves company and you don't want to feel alone. So whatever we can do to make other people calm themselves down and know they're not alone. And in fact, we're not only going to help them feel better, we're going to help them know that there's a community around them. So that's another aspect of a Sobe Sport Fitness, as well as a bit of Sarah Harding Fitness in general. It's just understanding that community aspect is really key. And again, 
that comes back to empathizing and helping people feel better. Now, the other, the next note, number four, is about um, remembering to laugh, that we somehow have to keep perspective in this. What I find interesting in Cirque du Soleil is the acrobats were not paid the most. Does anybody have an idea of who was paid the most or is paid the most um, in the hierarchy of the surf world? Any ideas? Produ yeah. Producers? Um, good question. No, le well, actually, let me, that's, you probably are onto something there. I was thinking more in the cast. Of those that are performing, if they are contortionists, if they are singers, if they are um, uh, stunt workers, or if they are clowns. Anybody got an idea? An idea there? No? Anybody want to take a guess? Singers? Mm -hmm. No. Just because they're clowns? Yeah. Believe it or not, clowns. And you look at that and you're like, why? <laughs> what, right? Like you could pretend to be Bozo and put on a, a nose and do something silly. But honestly, it's a lot harder to make people laugh than you think. It's a lot easier to do a backflip or, you know, some twisting salto that looks cool and, and is engaging, but doesn't necessarily make them laugh. And you probably have been to certain shows where you're like, no, they didn't make me laugh. Well, there you go. Like, even the clowns have a hard time sometimes making, making me laugh. So the more we can figure out how do we find humor in what we're doing, how do we laugh, how do we um, remember that, you know, at the end of the day, we got to find joy somewhere. If we're choosing this lifestyle, and yes, there are going to be a lot of hardships along the road, but if we can figure out how to laugh at ourselves and figure out how to find joy, it is totally, totally worth it. So one story that comes to mind is when I was uh, training at Cirque, one of the very first days, I arrived late because I had been competing in a Miss Fitness World competition. It was a European World Contest in Warsaw, Poland. So I arrived about a week late. And I felt so out of my element when I arrived. Because for one thing, it was super top secret when I agreed to be a part of the show. So I, I agreed without knowing anything. I said, sure, yeah, that sounds like fun. Like, start to slay it. Awesome. Yes, it would totally be that guinea pig for you. And I will test all the equipment and figure out where we need, and I didn't know this at the time, knee pads, shin guards, teeth guards. We are going to be those guinea pigs that get those bumps and bruises. And I did not know that until my very first day there, because we're training the bateau with the boat. So I climb on the boat, and have any of you been on, this is a fairly old, uh, old school type of amusement ride called the pirate ship, where it's it swings on a pendulum, right? And it goes back and forth. Well, imagine, that's what we're trying to create, but on a round bottom boat. And it's all manually rocked. It's not at all uh, automa automated. So we're trying to create this sensation. And one of the, one of the artists is on the back, on, on one of the sides here, right? And he's holding on here. And he's thankfully tethered in. He's attached to a belt, and the coach is pulling him. And he's trying to leap onto the mast and land on the mast like a little monkey with his feet here and catch like this. Well, of course, the rest of us are trying to rock it like this, but with a round bottom, we're making a lot of mistakes. Well, since it was my first day, they said, Sarah, um, probably best that you just hang on to the mast. Just go to the mast and just like cling to it, you know? <laughs> so I'm like, okay. So I'm thinking, all right, this is pretty cool. Yeah, this looks great. He's going to jump. And I'm looking up. <clears throat> Of course, he catches his hands, but his feet totally miss. I'm looking up, and where do his feet go? Quite literally, on my face. He lands on my face, I crumple to the ground, and then another person comes up, gives me a hand, and says, welcome to creation. This is what it's all about. This is us going from zero to one. We are making something from nothing. And there are going to be tons of trials, a lot of mistakes, as we try to figure out what we're doing. Well, later on that week, actually, I guess it was several weeks later, we're figuring out that you can rock this boat so big that if you rock it too big, you're actually going to tip the whole thing over, which is super, super dangerous. And so the coach calls me over and says, Sarah, you know what to do, right, if, if the boat starts tipping over? And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, that could have something else. What are we supposed to do? He's like, no, tell me. He says, you run the hell away as fast as you can because that's all he had. That was all he had. So I was like, oh my gosh, nobody knows. We have a sense, but we really don't know. We are in completely uncharted territory here, and we are the ones who have to figure that out. So trying to figure out a sense of humor, but also recognizing, yeah, this is some intense stuff. 
Now, one of the jokes that went along with the cast, and again, misery loves company, but one of the ways we commiserated and bonded over this was one of the girls that broke her foot early on in the creation kept her cast, and that became the trophy. Whoever had the biggest wipeout could pass it on to the next person. That was a, it was a badge of honor. You know, you survived this. And that's part of it, too. When we actually got to the show where it opened, there was such a sense of ownership. And that's what we want to create. If you're going through a startup and you're in that crazy, crazy world that is so intense, and believe me, I've helped out with startups, I've done some people operations there, I understand how rough it is and how often they fail. But if we can keep perspective and recognize this is all part of the ride, you know, there are going to be days we can't be the audience and we have to figure out how to get back up. So that brings me to my final point, which is talking about whatever doesn't kill us makes us stronger. <coughs> And we have to figure out how to gain perspective and figure out how to laugh and find that strength even when the time is tough. Um, when I was studying at Stanford, um, I studied East Asian studies, which again, somewhat, uh, you know, wide, diverse background. I had studied Chinese, Mandarin, and I wanted to go ahead and pursue um, East Asian studies. And I got to write my honors thesis on the Chinese gymnasts and their lifestyles and sacrifices they made. And when I was interviewing the gymnasts um, in the Beijing City Gymnastics Gym, it was underground, it was uh, very, very hot that summer, or most summers in Beijing, and here was a big red banner that read Chengdong Hu Zizai, Hu Zizai, Nan Chengdong. Chengdong is success, so success is not comfortable. And if you find yourself too comfortable, it's going to be hard to reach success. I found that very empowering, very inspiring, and really, really telling for those of us that stick with it, that if this is truly what you want, if this is your passion and you want to be there, and you want to be involved, and you want to help others, then yes, you are committing yourself to a very challenging lifestyle. That's something that you care deeply about. And that caring, that love, and that affection is going to resonate, and that's what's going to come forward and connect you to all of your users, all of your clients, and that's what's going to be empowering to get you through those tough times. So I'll conclude there. I appreciate you guys taking the time to watch the videos, to listen to me, reflect on how I designed um, my business, and really, again, very reflective of the life experiences I gathered along the way. We have about five, four or five minutes. If anybody has questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Yes? Um, how did you raise the money to start your business? Great question. And in my case, in my case, the capital that I used was primarily from my own cash flow, basically what I had started and what I had saved. And it started very small, and thankfully what I needed was I started a home studio and by simply getting some equipment and some used equipment through some Pilates instructors that I knew through Cirque du Soleil. So it was really through referrals and through um, figuring out how do I at least get the equipment and start in my home, kind of like a lot of garages, you know, you start at the home, whatever you can afford. And then as that grew, then figuring out maybe I can ask other companies to get involved and sponsor me first in kind and then see if there's some cash to support that. Um, and I actually was exploring a fitness DVD, that's what, one reason I reached out to Moby. And what was interesting was that fitness DVD ended up uh, not ever becoming a DVD that you sell this way, but just getting material to be able to be on YouTube. And so that's an avenue that I've been exploring. But what's interesting was I figured out that yes, this is a niche community, but this is such a finite group and it's such a short time that you're on maternity leave and that you want to exercise with your infant um, and you have to catch that window. So that's really been a challenge to figure out how do you get that window, and how do you capitalize on that really finite time, how do you get the exposure and the word out before that. So thankfully what ended up happening was more of the Sarah Harding Fitness stuff was more through referrals and thankfully in my particular business you didn't need as much capital to begin with so I was super grateful. And that actually started, I would say, I actually incorporated because I had won Miss Fitness USA twice and um, went on to do some fitness modeling. So that was that was huge. That definitely gave me a base to start with and say, okay, well, how can I then use that to generate more funds for future business? Any more questions? Yes. Are you important for your career, like going into that mm -hmm. mindset of necessarily becoming an 
entrepreneur with your own business, but going sort of you know, pursuing one career first, then getting experience? And it's, I cannot tell you how invaluable I think it is to get that life experience. Any life experience you have is going to provide that much more perspective. I think especially if you don't know exactly how you want to structure things going in, then be open to where life takes you and then keep grabbing those opportunities. I remember, you know, here I was when I graduated, um, I was class of 2000 and then I co-termed in 01 and got my uh, master's in communication in 01. Right after 01, there was 9-11 and it was just a really rough, hard time to find work. And I was trying to figure out what do I want to do, what do I want to do, and I was, uh, I was working part-time actually at Stanford's development office um, and it was thanks to volunteering at Stanford's, uh, PAC, at the time, Pac-10 Championships, Women's Gymnastics Championships, and it just so happened. And a lot of this was very serendipitous, and quite frankly, a lot of companies, even when you have a plan, a lot of serendipitous events occur that do um, obviously work in your favor if you see that, if you're open to that opportunity. But there was um, basically the UCLA Women's Gymnastics head coach was looking for acrobats, and they had to have already graduated, otherwise you were going to um, jeopardize your eligibility to be friends to win. And she said, hey, Sarah, what are you doing? this summer, would you be interested in working for SeaWorld? So I moved down to San Diego that summer because I wasn't finding job, you know, job in the Bay Area. I thought, okay, well, I'll go ahead and just explore. Like, it's a three-month gig. It'll be fun. It's great. We'll try it. And then that led me to coming back to the Bay Area and talking to the women's gymnastics head coach, who's still there now, Kristen Smith, and she said, why don't you put together a demo reel and really explore the whole acrobatic world, because there's a lot of really cool stuff out there. And that took me to Tokyo Disney, and I worked th for them for seven months before I went on to Cirque du Soleil. So yes, working for multiple companies, I think, truly does help, um, gives you that that experience. And I think also, you know, when you are thinking about business school, having that outside experience is huge. So you, you really have to figure out what is going to help set you up for success and give you the tools that you need um, to really do the best that you can to solve the problem that you choose. So I certainly recommend it, but you kind of figure, you have to figure out what works for you in your life. Yes? Um, when you decided not to go back to Circle LA, like what made you decide, what was going on in your head? Like how did you know that that was the right for you at that time? Mm, such a good question. Really, really challenging, and um, I want to be sensitive to time that's 7.01. Do you guys have a few minutes, or do we need to stop right now? Um, in the next like, yeah. minute or two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll try to keep it brief. But, you have to go. You know. Yeah, yeah, I understand. Um, basically, I think the miscarriage was another experience in my life where I realized how much do I want to be a mom, and what does that mean? And I had maternity leave, which was amazing, by the way, um, 12 whole weeks. But then I just felt it was too soon to go back to full-time work. And because my family was in Hawaii, his family was in Virginia, and we didn't have any local child care, I decided I wasn't quite ready. Um, and, you know, when we opened Search of show, Pilo Verte stood in front of us, and he said, creating a show, which I now see is having a startup in a lot of ways, creating a show is like giving birth to a baby and there are a lot of labor pains. There are a lot of aches and pains that you have to go through. And then when I actually delivered and understood what physically that means to go through that pain and that pressure, a lot of it actually is not so painful as it is not knowing the endurance. Like, how much longer do you have to endure this? When is this going to be over? When am I going to have my baby? <laughs> you know, when do I get to hold and press that baby? So that really was going through that labor experience. And, and to me, I thought I was going to go back to work until I went through